I quite often get asked what I do to manage pests in my garden, and my secret is I don't. I really haven't got the time to go out and check under all my plants, pick off any bugs by hand, or get liberal with a spray bottle of soapy water. And as an organic gardener, I'm not going to be applying any broad insecticides, that's for sure. Instead, I use these passive methods to limit any damage to my crops, and you can use them too to control pests in your veg patch without any effort. At the beginning of the year, when I'm sitting down and planning out which vegetables I'll be growing and spending far too much money on seeds, I'll also spend some time picking out what flowers I'll be growing. I started doing this to try and get as many pollinators as possible into my grey 6 by 6 metre fenced-in yard because my pandemic pumpkins wouldn't set fruit. But the benefits of planting companion flowers don't stop there. Flowers like calendula and French marigolds draw aphids away from other plants. I always find that aphids first appear on the young shoots of climbing beans or entirely covered broad beans being one of the first crops to start growing. As a countermeasure, I grow calendula, sometimes simply referred to as marigolds, around the base of my runner bean supports. And I also grow French marigolds along the edge of my garden beds. Both attract beneficial insects that attack aphids and you can eat the plants, which means technically you're still growing food. Another plant in this family is the sunflower, and those of you who know me will know that I can't help but sow a few seeds of a variety called Evening Sun. They are low effort plants, particularly if they self seed. They stand tall in an otherwise flat veg patch, and dotting them around my garden is a pillar of my passive pest control strategy. But the companion plants don't stop there. You can grow nasturtiums, which readily self seed, are also edible and deter aphids and whiteflies. Poached egg plants and zinnias are lovely little annuals, which attract more beneficial insects and act as sacrificial plants, while bushes like lavender are so fragrant that they seem to confuse and repel some pests. Lavender can be difficult to grow from seed, can take a long time to flower, but is worth it for the smell alone. And speaking of smells, you can interplant crops to deter pests too. Onions and garlic take up little space and produce very little foliage, so make great crops to grow in between plants that grow vertically and require a lot of airflow. Yes, I am talking about the tomato. They're my most prized crop, and while I don't often see pests on mine, onions are great at deterring aphids and beetles. And because I grow my tomatoes vertically and remove all of the lower leaves, I get all this extra space around the base of the tomato plant to grow more food. Onions are perfect because they don't mature till towards the end of the tomato plant's life, or even the following year. And the bulbs form towards the surface of the soil so they don't disturb the tomato roots. Of course, alliums aren't the only veg that you can interplant with. Many crops benefit from having herbs planted next to them because that strong fragrance confuses and even repels some pests. Basil is great for repelling pests like whitefly, mosquitoes, spider mites and aphids. And in the case of the tomato, planting basil nearby is said to improve the taste. Similarly, you could grow oregano, which is great for planting next to almost all vegetables. You could grow parsley, which attracts beneficial insects. Rosemary or sage, which both repel pests like cabbage moth and carrot flies. And thyme, which is just an all-round great herb. But perhaps the greatest benefit of interplanting like this is just how much money you can save harvesting and eating your own herbs, particularly if you use as much as I do when cooking. Of course, another way of controlling pests is to prevent them reaching your veg in the first place. Last year, my kale got entirely taken out by caterpillars. Moths or butterflies must have landed on the plants, laid their eggs, flown off, and left their children to munch away on my Cavallo Nero. This year, I'm not gonna get caught out, so I'm gonna use physical barriers like netting to protect my crop. For this to work, the holes need to be very, very small, so make sure to use a net that's specifically designed to keep out butterflies with holes that are no larger than 8mm by 8mm or smaller where possible. Support your net so that it doesn't come into contact with the brassicas, otherwise butterflies could still directly land on the plants. And be sure to secure both the top and the sides so no opportunists can sneak in through any gaps, because insects aren't the only vandals in the garden. Rabbits, pigeons, even this little girl here, they can all be bad news for your veg patch. One way of dealing with this is to pull up a small fence to prevent or even discourage animals from digging up your crops. And combined with a net, your veg plants will be locked up in their very own Fort Knox. But an even simpler way of protecting your valuable plants is to grow in containers or raised beds, which keeps both insects like carrot fly out, as well as making it more difficult for someone here to stop digging up my veg plants without realizing. Yes, you naughty girl. And while I might not have the time to go bug hunting myself, you can provide habitat support and attract a range of beneficial insects that feast on pests. And by supporting the wider ecosystem, you can outsource your pest control work to creatures like ladybugs or ladybirds, 
which I set to work on my aphids during the early season. Once I see an aphid outbreak on my beans, I can leave them be and then a week later, I'll notice ladybirds moving in. Ladybirds love plants like sunflowers, herbs like fennel and dill, and my favourites, marigolds and calendula, as mentioned earlier. Simple things like providing shelter over winter by not cutting back dead plants, avoiding using any pesticides and leaving them a banquet of aphids to eat in the spring will help attract them to your garden. Hoverflies, parasitic wasps, lacewings and soldier beetles can also be deployed in your pest fighting army and are all attracted to bright, colourful and fragrant plants. So be sure to leave space for a range of diverse and colourful flowers or scatter some wildflower seeds in the spring to get support from the legions of predatory insects. However, if preventative measures haven't worked out and wildlife just isn't on your side, then there is one last option. I hate doing this, but culling your losses and removing effective foliage can be a great strategy if you're completely overrun. By physically removing pests in the area, you eliminate current problems and potential future food sources for any pests left behind. This was the approach I took with my kale last year, and it sprung back and survived into the winter. Yes, sometimes your only choice is to style again. But if your plant is hardy and can bounce back quickly, regrowing foliage from just a single stem, then culling back hard can be a good emergency measure. It will delay harvest for a while, which can be an issue for long growing season crops, including some tomatoes, and obviously for crops like carrots, where the roots are getting attacked, or peas, where you can't cut back new growth without completely stunting the plants, this isn't going to be an option. In these cases, it might be easier to start again and sow more seeds, or accept the loss, because there's always next year to try again. But let's not forget about the microscopic pests attacking our plants. If you're growing tomatoes, then you'll need to follow the steps in this video here to prevent diseases like blight from affecting your crop. Remember to press the like and subscribe button to get more growing tips, and as always, happy gardening.